Hey, Cypher here. Midway was a mess of a movie. I've said it numerous times on this show, and I'll say it again, a movie needs to pick its battles. This time, that advice is quite literal. Midway is a perfect example of such a failure. The funny thing is, it's actually pretty accurate. This is one of those odd based on a true stories, where the movie is good historically, and bad for other reasons. I think it can be enjoyable, at least if you know what you're in for. It's a Roland Emmerich film, so it's always silly and bombastic. The problem is, he tried to make this into a history lesson about the beginning of the war, and it's a pretty bad lesson. You practically need a map and calendar to keep up with what's going on. Leave giving a history lesson to the professionals. The Battle of Midway is probably the most significant battle in US naval history. It's the real turning point in the Pacific theater during World War II. Before Midway, Japan quickly conquered much of the Pacific, and the US would spend the next three years clawing that territory back from them. For decades before the war, Japan conquered more and more territory. In the 1870s and 80s, they took many southern islands, beginning with annexing the Ryukyu Kingdom. By 1940, they were in Korea, Manchuria, North China, much of China's coast, and French Indochina. Because of the stark brutality of Japanese atrocities, the US attempted to curb Japanese aggression by increasingly embargoed goods in response. In 1940, we took away oil, which was the one thing Japan couldn't do without. The two countries were clearly on the warpath, and Japan decided to strike first and knock out America's Pacific might. After all, with France occupied by Germany and Britain barely hanging on in Burma, Japan could invade Indonesia without much trouble if the US couldn't intervene. So on December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. Have to cut in here real quick because, I kid you not, some actual Nazi propaganda from 1941 is claiming the copyright of that clip I just played. Yes, actual Nazi propaganda is using the content ID system to claim FDR's Day of Infamy speech. That's why it sounded all distorted, because I had to distort it. You want to talk about how broken the content ID system is on YouTube? Here you go. I had to distort a public domain clip of an American president simply to appease some copyright fascists. YouTube turned me into Neville Chamberlain. Thanks. They attacked the US fleet stationed in Pearl Harbor, killing over 2,000 Americans in the process. Within less than 24 hours, Japan attacked Wake Island, Guam, and the Philippines. They continued southward, invading Thailand, Burma, Indonesia, New Guinea, and eventually menacing Australia. Japan seemed unstoppable. The day after Pearl Harbor, America declared war on Japan. The army couldn't use their forces in the Philippines since they were defeated by February, and the Pacific was treacherous to cross after Hawaii. So while the army focused on Europe first, the navy had to make the Pacific safe for Allied shipping. But first, the US had to show that they weren't out of the game. A crack team of army pilots flew B-25s off aircraft carriers to bomb mainland Japan. It was a risk to even attempt, especially with such big planes. They even had to launch early to evade detection. The Doolittle raid, while fairly ineffective militarily, was a huge propaganda win. So the Navy pushed forward to protect Australia. The American Pacific Fleet's aircraft carriers were luckily out on maneuver during the initial Japanese onslaught. They were unproven before World War II, and many officers thought they were a distraction from battleships. But the four battleships sunk at Pearl meant the Navy had to go with carriers like the Japanese. 
This didn't exactly go well at first. In the Battle of the Coral Sea, we managed to stop Japan from taking the rest of New Guinea by sea, but suffered worse losses in terms of ships than them including a sunk fleet carrier, and another one significantly damaged. The USS Yorktown had to sail back to Pearl Harbor to get last-minute repairs in record time and ship out again to stop another Japanese offensive. This time at a tiny island only 1,400 miles west of Hawaii itself, called Midway. U.S. cryptologists managed to decipher enough Japanese transmissions to almost perfectly pinpoint when and where they would try to invade Midway. So the Navy sent the three remaining carriers in a ramshackled formation to surprise them. And the Japanese were caught off guard, but still had a mightier fleet. The crucial time it took for them to reorient and rearm was just what the U.S. needed. In the ensuing battle, we sank four Japanese carriers, sending the Japanese fleet scurrying back to the mainland in disgrace. This was a decisive blow to Japan. Not only had the U.S. stopped further Japanese invasions, but they halted a key stepping stone for Japan's plan for conquest. They intended to use Midway as the beginning of this large swath of invasions. Though Japan would attempt to break out again, from mid-1942 onward, the Allies fought a mostly offensive war in the Pacific. This is a prominent World War II battle. The historiography is a mile long, and there hasn't been anything new added to the conversation for decades. John Ford filmed the event itself, where he even received a minor wound during the fighting. The Navy turned that footage into a documentary only a few months later. The last major addition to the story was in the 1960s, when the US released the records for the cryptographic espionage leading up to Midway. And a bunch of Japanese accounts have added flavor since at least 1967. If it was something obscure, there might be more dynamic scholarship. But any new book on the subject is just a retelling of an old story with nothing new to add to it. Military history like this tends to stagnate because too many people care about war games and so few care about context. Obviously, the movie had plenty to go off of. It's kind of difficult to get things wrong here. The narrative is already well established and easy to tell. They also had direct assistance from the U.S. Navy. Heck, this movie has already been done before. There was a Midway film in 1976. It was boring too, but in a different way, because they substituted other footage from Tor Tor Torah and Ford's documentary. That meant the scenes were disjointed, making everything unrelated to the action, which is essential to the narrative. This movie gets it wrong in a different way, because they didn't pick their battles well enough. Which is sad, because this film was actually really accurate. We follow too many stories in this film to really keep track of them all, but generally everything shown is actually based on a true story. It's part of the quarter or so of films that actually do what they say they'll do. Yippee, a quarter of films can actually use the narrative they're based on. Jeez, it's so difficult to read a book. As such, there's a bunch of stuff that makes it into this film that's pretty cool to see. For instance, it shows the rivalry between the Japanese army and navy. They constantly bickered over policy, especially where to focus fighting. The army wanted mainland Asia, whereas the navy wanted the Pacific. So this is pretty cool to see. I've seen people complaining about the jingoism in this film. Please tell him it's time to haul ass with Halsey. Yes, sir. But one, it's an Emmerich film. What do you expect? And two, just like in We Were Soldiers, much of this supposedly overzealous dialogue is composed of quotes. It's a war film about a bunch of angry sailors who want revenge for Pearl Harbor. You know, I had a lot of friends at Pearl Harbor. So how about you go fuck yourself? Jingoism is par for the course, because that's reality. If you can't deal with truth, why are you watching a based on a true story movie? Though I do have to say this line... Now that's a problem. The honor culture of Japan is overstated here, and it's rather weird that the film is dedicated to both American and Japanese sailors. The movie somewhat accurately depicts how the Japanese treated POWs. 
though that wasn't with an anchor, but weighted water drums. But who cares about those details? The film also shows Japan's racist treatment of China for a little bit, which was absolutely horrendous. Though I don't know of any massacre specifically reprising the Doolittle Raid. But that's just the film misattributing causation. Massacring civilians like during the rape of Nanking, Korean comfort women, the Bataan Death March, and chemical weapons testing are enough to show a significantly different level of humanitarianism among the Japanese compared to their allied counterparts, including their navy regularly killing POWs, much of which the movie acknowledges. Despite that, it's still dedicated to Japanese sailors? I don't get it. The movie shows a deeper understanding in a number of ways. For instance, it pretty effectively explains how deciphering Japanese transmissions worked. So we're able to read about a quarter of their secure communications? Uh, no, not exactly. Uh, it's gibberish to me. Imagine that you're throwing a wedding. And maybe I've never seen the invitation, but the best band is booked. That's what signal intelligence can give you. And how the Japanese decision to rearm for naval action doomed them at the Battle of Midway. Or even how bombers targeted the deck symbol on Japanese carriers. Even most of the inaccuracies are minor. For instance, I saw a bunch of articles saying the movie showed bombers with both torpedoes and drop bombs, but I couldn't find that. They often show flight wings too close together. By the way, look at that guy's face. <laughs> but in all seriousness, that's just something movies have to do. And it doesn't hurt the narrative, which is the ultimate metric of whether or not inaccuracy matters. They show a US plane doing a stall maneuver that no pilot would have attempted. And finally, this guy practicing a no-flap landing is meant to show continuity with his landing after the battle. That's just not true. Dick Best, and yes, that's his real name, though I'm sure there's a porn star by the same name, but Dick Best was not some hot shot from Top Gun. Still, it's a harmless fictionalization. So with all that good, what makes this movie bad? A good history movie picks its battles. That's why Cradle to Grave movies, or ones trying to cover an entire war, typically suck. Focus on a single subject. Either choose a single battle, like the namesake of the movie, or a single character, like a commander or a ship. It's not that difficult. But Midway wants to not only show the battle, but drag its audience through an hour of events leading up to it. We see Pearl Harbor, the Doolittle Raid, and Coral Sea, plus a dozen other smaller events. There's no connective tissue, no narrative, no context. You're just supposed to know why these events happen. It makes no sense. I can give the larger context because I can show maps and narrate the narrative. This is why a book can do things a movie can't. It's a limited medium. The audience gets lost with all these things happening. It also kind of shows that the filmmakers didn't really think highly of the audience. Yet they failed to give enough of the narrative for the audience to follow their flimsy history lesson. This is where showing is not enough. We need narration to link everything together. But that would turn it into a docudrama. Instead, I think one can tell this story without showing Pearl Harbor and all the other stuff. Like, I'm confident that most audience members are not too stupid to understand that Pearl Harbor happened before the US actually declared war. We don't need to see that. Just start the movie with the cryptologists talking about an invasion of Midway and end it with the Japanese retreating. That's narrowing the subject matter enough to keep the audience within the narrative. But they had to include an hour of useless buildup. They should have just picked their battles by going with the actual title of their movie. 